the next and the final panel for this evening, which will be Geography of Affect, moderated by Professor Abhishek Parvi from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Madras. Let me now introduce the panelists for this evening. Uh, Reshma PK, uh, an MPhil scholar in English language and literature from the Institute of, Institute of English, University of Kerala. She'll be speaking on her paper titled Landscaping Horror, Geography and Horror in Select Hollywood Horror Movies. The concluding panelists for this evening will be Genevieve Z. Yogaraja, a research scholar from the Department of Sociology, Shiv Nathar University, presenting her paper titled A HIV Ward as a Site of Care, Ethnographic Notes from Mizoram. Panelists will be given 15 minutes to present the paper. Uh, those who would like to present a, a presentation or a paper to the audience, uh, kindly inform your moderator and you will be given presenter access. After the completion of all panelists, the moderator will then ask their questions, followed by questions from the members of the panel, followed by members of the audience through the chat box or audio. The session will conclude with the closing remarks by the moderator. This session will be recorded for archival purposes. Use of derogatory or offensive language is strictly prohibited and will attract serious action. I now leave the floor to Professor Arvishek Paduri to moderate the panel, Geography of Affect. So the panelists are here, presumably uh, Reshma PK from University of Kerala. And then we have uh, Genevieve Yogaraza from uh, Shivnada University. I think we're missing uh, Lavanya Dalal, who has some health issues. So I'm sorry to learn that. So um, if the panelists are ready, we can start the session. Uh, so we'll go with Reshma first, and we'll follow it with uh, Genevieve. And then each person will have 15 minutes. But then again, because we have only two speakers, we can afford to have a little bit of a spillover. Uh, so do not worry if you are just uh, crossing the 15-minute things. That's fine. And we can have the questions together in the end. People can write their questions, and I'll be happy to uh, forward those. And of course, I will be happy to uh, offer up so commentary on the papers as well. So we'll start with uh, Reshma without no further ado. Uh, Reshma PK is from the Institute of English, University of Kerala. And it sounds like a really fascinating paper, which is titled uh, Landscaping Horror. Geography and horror in select Hollywood horror movies. Uh, so, Reshma, if you're ready, you can uh, you kindly start the session. Thank you. Yes, sir, I am ready. So, I yeah. have a PPT, so I'll share my screen. Sure. Okay, so right. my screen is visible. It is visible, yes. Thank you, sir. So my paper is titled Landscaping Horror, Geography and Horror in Select Hollywood Horror Movies. So nature always acted the role of a muse for the writers. Thomas Hardy's novels, like a critic said, is filled with the smell of haze and flowers. The amazing pastoral beauty is always a pleasure giver for me. So the relevance of space and geography in literature and work art can be traced from their origins itself. Place or space can be used as a metaphor to explain both the beauty of nature and at the same time, horror or wrath of nature. Like literature, movies also portrayed and mentioned different perspectives from the, for the space. So horror is a cultural practice that involves around in inducing fear. This practice goes back a long way and is widespread across different cultures. I quote, horror has been an important genre for millennia, unquote. And modern day horror movies are one reflection of this practice in popular culture. They translate ancient activity of telling creepy fairy tales into visual narrative form. In doing so, they provide, I quote, a way to conceptualize, give shape to, and deal with the evil and frightening. Thus, as a cultural practice, horror has attracted movie buffs to the yana. The dark hills and the gothic architecture of Dracula's Transylvania is the best example. 
different directors experimented on the same Dracula, but the settings never changed. The crucial role played by the place or space can be noted. Thus, visual culture plays a huge role in spatiality. The Sabyana of Eco Horror, the title given to the intersection of the horror yana and eco criticism, encompasses works that span innumerable cultures and ages as well as mediums. Even in the last decade, the rapid expansion of technology and other means of storytelling has been met with the proliferation of horror, including eco horror, across these new platforms. The canon of eco horror now extends beyond novels, television shows, theater, and film to include examples found in smartphone apps, podcasts, YouTube channels, and more. Narrowing the field of comparison to the medium of feature-length films allows for a specific subset of unique individual works within this canon to be directly compared to each other without needing to engage hundreds of works from more serial-based mediums. Example, as I have already mentioned, television shows, podcasts, comics, etc. So tensions between human and non-human nature have always played a role in the horror yana. This ongoing fiction is not the focus of the study, though much interesting research has been done in this field. Notably, one of the most significant trends within eco horror is the subgenre of work called revenge of nature these works such as alfred hitchcock's the famous the birds released in 1963 or stephen spielberg's jaws 1975 often have an icon of known human nature act as a reminder of the threat known human nature is to the humans who too often forget that they do not rule the planet without with complete dominion. So, in this paper, I'll be looking on the idea of geography and horror in select Hollywood movies, Hills Have Eyes, 2007, Sector 7, 2011, A Quiet Place, 2018, and Pet Cemetery, 2019, and how the different places of geography invokes horror in different ways among the audience. So let's start with Hills Have Eyes. So as you all know, it's a, it was a blockbuster. So Hills Have Eyes is an American horror film sequel to the Hills Have Eyes, uh, which was released in 2006. So uh, the movie is set in a vast hilly land surrounded by deserts. The barren land and the silence around them foreshadows a disaster. And the setting is also peculiar that we couldn't find any other animal species, even the sound of crickets. The movie opens with a horrifying scene where the mutant hates murdering a pregnant woman. So the New Mexico desert is termed as six, Sector 16, where they test several nuclear bombs. The United States Department of Defense sent a military team to evacuate all other mutants and a team of scientists are also working there and they are installing a surveillance system. Later, a group of national guardsmen were sent to that area in order to help the scientists. So from this point, story starts. So we could only hear the hustle of wind witnessed by rocky barren hills and scorching heat. The sprawling creature filled with rusting cars is also horrifying. Later, uh, one of the protagonists of the film, Napoleon and Amber, were asked to stay at the camp and other, others led by Sarge start to search the hill. So, uh, meanwhile, some mutants attacks them and forces them to run to the hill. So, the hills in the movie plays a huge role and join with the others. Meanwhile, the mutants started to attack the others who are in the hills and some even murdered by the murdered by them the way they attack the team is also interesting that they use the hills as their shield as they know every nook and corner of the hills it's quite easy for them to hide and attack and that's why uh, they force uh, the other two to join with the others even though they are mutants they use this hill as their hills as their strong tool 
the team brilliantly attacks them by hiding under the holes and pulling the guardsmen and some even uses the sharp ropes to kill the men. Except one or two small bushes, they can't find anything green in the hill and they can't hide behind any ropes because as the title suggests, the hills are surveillance by the mutants. And they can't even climb down because uh, then it will be easy for the mutants who are hiding inside the hills to cut down the ropes and which eventually leads to their death. So in this slide, uh, you can see some of the scenes from the movie, uh, which clearly depicts the horror or the barren hills and uh, two characters trying to get from the hill using a, a rope. And <clears throat> later the surviving team finds one of the scientists who is mortally wounded and explains why the mutants are attacking them. And later, uh, Missy, another protagonist in the movie, got attacked by the mutants and she was captured by the uh, by them and he took her to the mining cave. So again, like the hills, the mining caves also plays a crucial role in the movie. Like the hills, the mining caves are also lifeless, which is also horrifying due to its death, deadly silence. And like the hills, it has several confusing rules and it's quite hard for a person to find the way out. Uh, so um, later they find a way out, at least uh, at the last scene of the movie, we could see a mutant watching the trio through the surveillance equipment. So the geography of nuclear tests in the movie is presented without any cartographic signs. So moving on to the second movie, that is Sector 7. So it's a South Korean 3D monster horror science fiction, and it's, it is also the first Asian 3D IMAX movie. So from the safety of land, it's easy to romanticize the ocean. Its shades of blues and greens evoke paradise while its surface rises and falls hypnotically. But these mesmerizing qualities belie the ocean's perilous nature. With every storm, death rears its head confronting you with a fate too terrifying to imagine. Perhaps that's why the ocean lies at the heart of countless legends. People want to seek answers from the unknown to be enthralled by the horror. From a monster that unnerves a ship's hardened crew to a luxury linear that simply disappears. So the movie Sector 7, uh, is set in the region of ocean called Sector 7. A small team of oil rig workers are searching for undiscovered oil at the oil rig in Sector 7, and they are drilling 8,000 feet under the sea near the Jeju Island. Uh, the team is in the vast ocean, and they are also alienated from the other living beings. They could only see the ocean in front of them. Even though the headquarters asked them to stop the drilling because of their failed attempt to find oil, uh, the, uh, the protagonist in the movie, Hei Jun, encourages the team to drill once more. And uh, they are using the underwater exploratory ship named Eclipse. So when they start to dig, they suddenly find something suspicious and their, crews me their crew members start to die one by one. And finally, they find the reason who was a sea monster or a sea, a sea alien. Because of a he heavy storm, there is no possibility to evacuate the place both the storm and the claustrophobic ocean plays a huge role in the movie. So um, in this movie, we could see how ocean plays a uh, huge role. And now moving on to the third movie, A Quiet Place, uh, which, is, which, which is an American horror movie. Uh, and as you all know about this movie, it is about a post-apocalyptic world surrounded by blind monsters with hypersensitive theory. So, uh, so the Abbott family is now, they are the protagonists, or they are the central characters in the movie, is now in a deserted place where they walk barefoot and communicate in sign language. Even though the movie portraits a play with uh, trees and shrubs, the pin drop silence and the deserted place evokes horror among the audience. Evelyn, uh, who is the wife of Lee, is in her last stage of pregnancy and they are living with horror and fear. 
so they choose to stay in the new place in order to escape from the alien because due to the constant uh, sounds in the place it would be hard for the alien to catch them so here we can see how silence is contrasted even the lush greenery soothing sound of nature evokes horror among the audience that behind this natural beauty there is horror and fear so um um meanwhile uh, regan and marcus uh, uh, who are the character who are also uh, an important characters in the movie uh, takes refuge at top of grain silo the dark green long grass blades surrounding the grain silo evoke horror among the viewers later uh, lee got attacked and eventually murdered by the aliens and the movie ends with the survived ones waiting for another attack by the monsters so the broad daylight is always my guys request you to wind up in another 3 minutes maybe okay okay right thank you okay and then uh, okay so i'll rush okay uh, now we have another movie named pet cemetery it's an american supernatural movie and <clears throat> so um in the movie we could see the element of folk gothic where the landscape is absolutely important so space reinforces the return of the past in the present a uh, moreover in the characters are in that characters are trapped in a landscape that is itself steeped in history and folklore the same can be seen in the ancient burial ground in the movie uh, this landscape has not only been formed by humans but has in turn um from those who have lived uh, there so in the movie we could see the landscapes of the creeks new property property the path of the cemetery the barrier the forbidden terrain beyond little boat swamp is also crucial uh, so the dead victor says to louis uh, they are the characters in the movie i quote the land is sour and then uh, judd later tells him the land is bad to which louis adds the land is sour part of the badness of this land is precisely the effect it has on those who ventures on to it as it has been for many others the deadly pull of this land the agency of this land is too much for louis so at the um, edge of the forest lurks a threat pools beaches and water hemlocks are menacing enough but the hills are also rife with forces itching to remind humans how ins insignificant we are they host murder and mayhem mutation backward criminality and simply blackness so this space beyond the edge whose flora and fauna not it and perhaps perhaps you are never to be fully subservient to the logics of settler colonialism plantation and capitalism the message of much of us horror storytelling is that no world is more terrifying for a white man than the one that descends him and as such destroys him so as a conclusion horror fictions are very much about ambient ambiance place surroundings and environment while lesser examples of the yana use stock scenarios like haunted house misty graveyards and um, rock outcroppings so most of the finest pieces of horror writing explore the expression of place in highly specific and deeply innovative ways so i would like to end my presentation with the words of lovecraft that for lovecraft it was the new england landscape with its vast and gloomy virgin forests in whose perpetual twilight all terrors might well lurk thank you thank you very much reshma for sticking to the time it was a really interesting presentation and i for one i have a lot of questions which i will uh, direct at the end but uh without any further ado we will quickly move on to uh jenevi yogaraja since uh, lavanya is unfortunately absent uh so jenevi's paper uh, uh she's from shivnada university it is titled an hiv ward as a site of care ethnographic notes from mizoram so jenevi if you're ready you could just kindly start the presentation Uh, thank you professor and thank you reshma that was a wonderful presentation maybe we could uh, have a discussion on how we understand horror in different sites yours in a text and mine in a word um okay so i'm going to start my uh, presentation with a little note uh, my interest in the relationship between space and care uh, exponentially increased during the pandemic 
while conducting my research, I did not give it too much thought, even though my whole ethnographic fieldwork took place within a HIV ward, TB clinic, and a TB MDR isolation ward. Of particular interest uh, to me has been the term isolation and what the interrogation of this term would mean for a discipline like anthropology, whose mode of inquiry depends on contact. Today, I will present several sections, uh, mostly el uh, ethnographic elaborations from my PhD thesis, reworked and condensed for a 15-minute presentation. I use the term ethnographic note in my title because uh, the first half may seem uh, uh, really structured, but the second half is actually a transcription of my field fieldwork notes from my notebook which I have just put together without any correction. So uh, that's also to uh, convey a feeling of uh, this kind of sense that I was feeling when I entered the ward in the first week of my research. How, how did I sense this place so that everyone gets this, uh, what I mean by affective infrastructure, not just for the people who are there, but also people who visit, people like uh, uh, chari uh, charity workers, uh, humanitarian aid workers, and even researchers uh, like me. Okay, so I'm just going to start uh, the backdrop, field sites, and method. Uh, my research project explores the everyday practices of giving and receiving HIV treatment and care in the context of historical and ongoing mission encounters, bureaucratization and pharmaceuticalization of care, declining state funding for HIV AIDS program, and the role of church and community in HIV treatment and care in Mizoram. For this study, I chose Mizoram as a privileged site for ethnography. Besides being my home, Mizoram has the highest HIV and cancer burden in India. Uh, this is in uh, uh, relation to the population. Additionally, the state is the epicenter for India's opioid epidemic. Mizoram shares a 510 kilometer long porous international border with Myanmar, the world's second largest producer of opium. This makes Mizoram the first stop for heroin trade out of the region. The heroin trade saw a steep rise when alcohol pro prohibition was imposed in the state. From 1997 to 2014, Mizoram had a total ban on alcohol pushed by local churches and the Young Mizo Association. The state offic officials, community leaders, and healthcare providers that I interacted with believed that the ban on alcohol led to local dealers switching from alcohol to heroin. It is in this backdrop of multiple epidemics, healthcare crises, and moral panic in a state with a predominantly Christian population that my research project took shape. For this research, conducted between April to June 2016 and October 2016 to July 2018, I was granted privilege access to a mission, this is a Christian mission hospital, in Aizol, the capital of Mizoram. Since HIV treatment and care continuum is an expansive field, it can be a challenge deciding where to begin, how to delimit, and where to anchor one's research. HIV care can be situated anywhere in the hospital, the clinic, the hospice, a community-based organization, advocacy groups, or at home. I decided to anchor my research where treatment is obvious, a clinical ward. This ward is called care home. Uh, in this study, the terms uh, ward, clinic, and hospice will be used interchangeably due to the unique position that care home occupies. As an extension of a mission hospital, care home is classified as a ward. This is administratively it's, uh, classified as a ward. Patients begin their admission process in the main hospital complex. The service that care home provides is described as hospice care. The ward also serves as a clinic for outpatients. It also functions as a home for patients shuffling between different hospitals, rehab centers, and prison. Care home is a hub of care and coordination among different sites, uh, private and public hospitals, integrated counseling and testing centers, antiretroviral therapy centers, TB clinics, community-based organizations like the Young Mizo Association, which is the largest NGO in the state, prisons, juvenile correctional homes, halfway homes, uh, rehab centers, faith-based NGOs, and uh, in individual families running foster homes and other wards in the main hospital complex. And it remains the center of HIV care in Mizoram, mainly because it offers free hospice service. The free service includes bed, food, first x-ray test, medicines for opportunistic infections, and counseling sessions. 
Um, there were other unofficial transactions that were not categorized as free service. These were gifts, of course. For example, paying for patients' cap, cap fare, buying relatively inexpensive medicines for patients that were not covered under the care home free, host, uh, free service. The team at care home is under the supervision of two charismatic doctors who were working towards bringing together biomedicine, advocacy, and palliative care. As a hub that connects various sites of care on one hand, and then as a, an extension of a mission hospital on the other, Care Home becomes a productive site to understand how different discourses, institutions, and practices come together to address the healthcare crises in Mizoram. Now, a little bit about care and its contradictions or the paradox that are built into care itself. Um, to conceptualize everyday care at a site like Care Home, this paper brings together anthropological literature on the everyday. Um, this understanding of everyday I borrow from uh, Veena Das and hospital infrastructure. It proposes that we understand sites of biomedical and palliative care as affective infrastructure, where daily interactions within the ward are not only marked by schedules, routine, habits, heterogeneity, but also by hope, doubt, fear, frustration, compassion, forgiveness, suspicion, failure, uncertainty, rumors, etc. These affective states and emotive orientations are shaped not just by how the space is planned or imagined, but also by the attitudes and expectations of healthcare workers, patients, and their primary caregivers, who are often family and friends. The paper will elaborate on how care is constituted within the space and what are the contradictions built into this kind of care. I work this out through ethnographic descriptions of how this place is named and classified, the logic of care, the flow plan and how patients are uh, classified and placed and the material semiotic practices in the ward. Furthermore, by examining contradictions built into care itself, uh, I will show how everyday care oscillates between uh, quote unquote hard bio biomedical protocols and quote unquote soft compassionate mode, making it difficult to effectively implement safety protocols and classify transgressive actions as negligence or non-compliance. Okay, so stepping into the ward, uh, naming and classifying the space. For administrative purposes, care home is classified as one of the wards within the mission hospital. Having the word home in its name means that care home is also considered a halfway home, a refuge by many patients who are abandoned by or estranged from their family. Care home functions like a hospital ward, a hospice, and a home. Uh, the classification of a space uh, into hospital ward, hospice, or home points us towards what is to be expected. It also shapes how rules and regulations are enforced. For instance, when compared to the main hospital complex and its different wards, care home as a home has relatively flexible rules for visitors. The visiting hours are not restrictive and visitors do not have to sign in. Uh, I should also add here, which I have not added in the paper that I submitted, that uh, even the things they carry in are not uh, regulated. So they're not checked. While in the main hospital complex, things are checked. They go through security checks. In the main hospital complex, the entrance to the different wings, uh, laboratories, private cabins are controlled and guards are stationed at each entrance. Um, the logic of care at this place, uh, care at care home is an assemblage of biomedicine, palliative care and compassion associated with Christian charity. The compassionate mode of care promotes touch and proximity, while the biomedical mode insists on maintaining distance through the wearing of masks, washing of hands, disinfecting clothes, etc. Um, aware that people living with HIV and TB patients uh, almost always experience social stigma, the care staff were often very careful and um, sometimes uh, a little uh, conscious about enforcing safety protocols. They would often discuss, uh, you know, how to how to tell patients to uh, wear masks uh, so that they don't think that it's them who could infect them, but they're also prone to lots of infections because of the conditions that they have to live with. Uh, floor plan of care home. Uh, within its compound, the Mission Hospital has two care centers dedicated to alcohol rehab and HIV AIDS uh, care, respectively. The care centers emerged and expanded when Mizoram started recording high rates of drug and alcohol addiction and HIV cases in the mid-1990s. 
founded in the in 2004 care home is official uh, so it's officially classified as a care center in the what's surprising is that in the church documents it's classified as a care center in the hospital records it's classified as a ward uh, care home unlike other wards is located away from the physical congestion of uh, the main hospital complex situated on a hillside care home is barely visible from the main road it is quite less populated and less busy compared to the bustling main hospital complex i mean this separation from the main hospital complex al already conjures up images of a hospital located on a distant island the new care home is a four year old two story concrete building which is divided into two general wards referred to as dormitories um, and single bed cabins also called isolation ward the cabins are reserved for critical cases which is end of life care and hiv tb or tb mdr patients the two eight bedded dormitories and 12 single bed cabins uh, eight for adults and four for pediatric patients are spread across two floors the ground floor is for male patients and the second for female patients uh, patients are encouraged to stay in the dormitories on inquiring why they encourage this one of the nurses responded it's good to be with other patients who are going through the same thing once they are able to talk about their condition to a fellow patient it becomes easier for them to do the same outside the ward um here i should also add that uh, within care home uh, they encourage disclosure so often patients are also forced to disclose their status uh, and uh, caregivers think this is the first step to healing um even though patients are accommodated in different spaces depending on their condition all patients use the same toilet and bathroom eat in the same mess uh, use the same water cooler and this produces tensions in care home in biomedical discourse there's a conceptual distinction between the terms isolation and quarantine isolation is the separation of sick people with a contagious disease from people who are not sick while quarantine separates and restricts the movement of people who are exposed to contagious disease to see if they become sick um these people may have been exposed to a disease and do not know it or they may have the disease but do not show symptoms so the uh, distinction uh, can i request you to wind up another couple of minutes maybe yeah 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 i'm almost done um yeah. the distinction you get the distinction you get here is of being diagnosed with a disease versus waiting for a diagnosis however in care home this distinction did not and could not work based on how the space is designed and the challenges of regulating the movement of people things and information containing bodies to prevent uh, spread of disease was the main concern however there was fear and anxiety regarding the circulation of quote and quote bad substances like pan tobacco and sour snacks called burmese things that caused mouth sores loss of appetite irritation of the bowel additionally the care staff had to constantly deal with rumors spreading in the dormitory as this affected patient to patient relationship and the sleeping arrangements for instance one of the rumors that would often spread was related to skin infections okay i'm going to leave out one section but just last i think this concluding point is important as a concluding note i would like to address a methodological issue to understand notions of isolation and contact it was also important to address the mode of doing field work and the position of the ethnographer way before covid i was introduced to a daily routine of wearing masks washing hands and dis disinfecting my clothes after a day of ethnographic field work in the mission hospital and the tb clinic the kind of masks i wore and the kind of disinfecting regimen i followed depended on where i had been on a given day uh for instance during morning rounds in the dormitory at care home i did not wear a mask um i wore a mask in the private cabins and i did not enter the private cabins but if i was around the private cabins i wore a mask uh i wore a mask in the tb clinic and laboratories that i visited uh this posed certain challenges when it came to interacting with hiv tb and tb mdr patients their caregivers of caregivers and visitors just like my interlocutors i found myself feeling conscious about wearing a mask while interviewing patients and their relatives the mask became a barrier many times since a smile to establish connection became impossible and my voice was often muffled i had moments of doubt and fear when i would hear stories about primary attendants and visitors contracting tb just like me family and friends of patients displayed discomfort with wearing mask around loved ones uh due to the stigma associated with hiv and tb wearing mask and insistence on washing hands came with its own set of affective intensities thank you um i think i'll end here thank you very much anubhav
So uh, that concludes the session in terms of the presentations, and we have some time for questions. Uh, arranging it this way. Uh, this must be a very interesting dialogic relationship between uh, Reshma's paper and Genevieve's paper in terms of uh, how the entire ontology of speciality or the experience of speciality is also already temporal in quality, right? So there's sort of space and time operate in a sort of continuum-like way. So uh, speciality and temporality sort of club together in ways which are mappable and sometimes unmappable. And I think both papers were discussing at a fundamental theoretical level the sort of the play between mappability and unmappability. And that's where the notion of tactility comes in, the notion of care comes in, the notion of estrangement comes in. Uh, because, you know, if you look at the, uh, the ontology of horror cinema, I mean, what happens in horror cinema is a production of strangeness. And the better the film is, the production of strangeness will be better. So it's but literally, I mean, the supernatural is really a production of the uncanny, something that is happening outside of the known space. Uh, so uh, do we have any questions uh, in the chat box? Uh, or is anyone who would like to ask a question to any of the two speakers? Uh, I have a couple of questions, but I'll reserve that uh, for the end. So the floor is now open for questions, if anyone would direct it to either Reshma or Genevieve. Right, so if I could just uh, sort of exploit my position as a moderator and ask a quick question to uh, Reshma first and then to Genevieve. These are sort of connected questions, but I'll still break it down into different ways just to contextualize it in the uh, specific context of each paper. Uh, so Reshma, I mean, it was a fantastic paper and horror movies obviously, uh, they, they offer a very complex cognitive frame and as that's something you talked about quite extensively as well. And of course, spatiality is a very important factor in horror movies because, you know, the whole production of strangeness in horror cinema is how uh, the known and the mappable space suddenly becomes unmappable, right? Or if you sort of use up more Freudian vocabulary, uh, the sudden production of the uncanny or the unhomely. Because if you sort of go back to his... Uh, uh, etymological rules, uncanny in German is unheimlich, which means outside the home, right? So there's a very strong spatial quality about uncanny. It's outside the home. It's outside the familiar space, right? So the entire discourse of horror in horror cinema, of course, is to sort of produce a space which is outside the home, an unhomely, uncanny, strange space. So given that, and of course you mentioned some really interesting examples, uh, so I mean, in terms of the theoretical frameworks, apart from speciality, which of course is a very, very important factor in horror cinema, I'll be more, I'll be interested to know, and of course you touched upon it, but I'll be interested to know if you can expand on this. I mean, how do you draw on something like, let's say, effect theory or thing theory uh, in your analysis of horror films? If you could just speak about it a little bit. Uh, are you, uh, could you hear me, Reshma? Hello? Hello, am I audible? You are, Reshma, yeah, please go ahead. Okay, first of all, thank you for the question. And, okay, um, okay about, um, so, in my paper, I was uh, um, more, con more of uh, giving importance to these uh, four movies and how uh, the idea of space or speciality and horror works in these movies. So, as you asked, right. it was about effect theory. So, right. um, and you have rightly pointed out the how I used the idea of uncanny and all. So, uh, right. uh, by effect theory, it means to impact or change, right? So, uh, we can use it as a noun uh, and it, it, we can say that it is the result of a change. So, uh, well, uh, looking at the four movies, what I could understand is that we could find another meaning in it. That the message that of much of U.S. horror storytelling, uh, we could see the settler colonialism and how the idea is uh, presented in this uh, in these four movies. So the right. message 
this us horror story telling is that no world is more terrifying for a white man than the one that descends him so uh, yeah. the very concept of white or white man came to exist only in relation to others Uh, right. For example, indigenous people hand over their lands, then disappears. Then white right. women extend man's property, and blacks multiply it through physical labor, including black women's reproduction. So the concept of an ideal subject of the Western world comes into being only through this structure. So without it, man might to be forced uh, to face what uh, calls the horror of nothing. Uh, so right. the Western world order alchemizes, or um, we could say the non-white subjects into tools for man's uh, cobalt individualism. So unfortunately for man, these appendages or objects have always had a life of their own. So from the outset, man assumed that the soil emptied, we can call it both literally or figuratively, of its original inhabitants is a fecund and plain. Uh, as this the enslaved labor that turns this, this soil into profit but the intertwined histories of settler colonialism and slavery are also always about fugitivity so the first enslaved africans brought to the americans fled into the mountains of hispaniola already home to indigenous maroon so landscape inhospit inhospitable to white settlers became the refuge of non white fugitives uh, the amoral the soil not only gave fruit and profit to whoever exploited it but also yielded the tools of rebellion uh, for example poisonous plants to halt a forced pregnancy or trap to kill the master uh, and ra rapist uh, so and herbs to heal wounds inflicted through work and punishment and zombies to turn against humans so a uh, soil from one perspective and sheltering from another emerges as a central trope and i think we can easily connect this idea with what you have already mentioned with affect theory and specifically with the help of these four movies right right excellent i think this is a very very um, rich response uh, Uh, Rajma, there's a question uh, at the chat box from Atria, uh, and uh, so Atria, if you can hear me, is this addressed to Rajma, or do you want to address this to Genevieve? I suspect it's addressed to Genevieve, but could you clarify? Yeah, please? yeah, uh, I am addressing the question to the second speaker. Yes, wonderful. Uh, so I'll just read it out. It's a really uh, interesting question, Genevieve. Uh, this is addressed to you, and so it goes like this: How do you place the theoretical concept of larger labor studies literature in terms of collective bargaining, political subjectivity, and identity formation? What relation does affective labor have in relation to immaterial labor uh, as a categorical imperative, and how does alienation operation uh, through this or operate through these modalities? So we're looking at the idea of uh, identity formation through political subjectivity and affective labor and alienation. So these are the uh, conceptual terms uh, uh, included in the question. So I think what you know what this really wants from you, expects from you, Genevieve, is that how do you map these concepts onto your research uh, on the sort of hospital space that you've undertaken so lately? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. Thank you, Atri, for the question. Um, actually, uh, my uh, research is placed within a body of uh, science and technology studies. Uh, I understand care as a set of semiotic material practices, and uh, I'm trying to move away from understanding even the work of nurses and doctors uh, in within. The older body of literature, I would understand. So, uh, in in the place that I went and studied uh, care, um, uh, people are working in the mission hospital. Uh, they understand their work as a vocation, the Weberian sense, as a calling, and uh, it's a kind of uh, gift, right? If you put it, if you place it within anthropological literature on uh, uh, gift and reciprocity. So uh, I place my work there. So I haven't actually really thought about collective bargaining, political subjectivity, because uh, I also don't look at the hospital just as a site of power and knowledge. Um, that's why I begin to look at the everyday. So not understanding, uh, you know, these uh, uh, very uh, 
transitional like when you go uh, when you go to a hospital it you understand your time in the hospital in terms of what appointments testing and it's it's within a pe- uh, particular understanding of uh, temporality here i also i was actually very curious when i went to the hospital because i ended up staying there almost every day and every night i also problematized veena das's concept of the everyday a little bit because i i include the every night and with people who 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 experience chronic illness these also get flipped so uh, the day becomes night the night becomes day um, uh, uh, so i place my work within that body of literature so i don't know i'm actually not very familiar in terms of alienation i think estrangement everyday life obviously like in the in the in the world i would understand even just um, uh, this whole notion of isolating someone how like this biomedical protocol of isolating someone how it also uh, creates sorts of tensions uh, within the notion of uh, within understanding meso sociality itself because it also clashes with that understanding and affective labor labor in the hospital i understand it as a combination of actually not just that warm caring you know notion that you understand it as but i also understand it as emotional labor right of which includes technique so it's technical practices so for instance a nurse who's giving who's providing care in that uh, in care home uh, she may be trained to do uh, put pills in a specific way organize pills in a specific way knows how pills be uh, given morning the time all of that uh, but also uh, nurses i'll tell you where the emotional or the affect comes in they begin to recognize that for people with chronic illness it's very difficult to even swallow pills on a regular basis so the small you know kind of uh, the care that i was interested in in also among the caregivers is like what do they do how do they solve these issues and i remember one nurse actually when she went for her palliative care training she came back with a mortar and pestle to you know crush medicines for the patient so i think it's it's it's, it's within this body of let- literature that i understand uh, forms of estrangement uh subjectivity uh not within i i i have a feeling this is also like a a very specific uh, literature right a priya that you're uh, what kind of authors do you have in mind uh if i would just like to comment about the authors i have negri and hot in mind and the concept of immaterial labor and uh, also so uh, the concept of effective labor which has been later extended by many scholars yeah negri and hart effective labor is within what they understand as the post ford fordist era right and what would work mean when you begin to address what is called quote and quote immaterial uh, labor but here within my body of literature i'm understanding it as a set of semiotic and material practices uh, uh, starting from the work of dutch anthropologist uh, anne marie mole so it's very bo- different body of literature and i frame my work within that so i i i yeah it's not the conceptual terms that i'm working with thank you so much thank you so much yeah right thank you uh, genevieve for a really interesting response are there yeah. any other questions uh, you could directly uh, type it in or you can just uh, Ask your questions directly to Genevieve or to Rosna. Uh, if I could quickly uh, come in slash have a question for Genevieve, uh, it's a really interesting concept because if I understand it correctly, you're also looking at this very Cutodian quality of the hospital. It's not just a place for estrangement. It's not just a place for alienation. there's also a daily next question about the hospital if i understand it correctly it's sort of people come stay and you know things work around little rituals and i was fascinated by this little example you just gave someone went and brought back a pestle and a mortar uh, in order to crush medicine so again uh, we sort of bring in materials from different contexts the domestic concepts the daily concepts and sort of relocating and mapping that onto the otherwise medical site of the hospital and in a certain sense this dailiness of uh, the medical space uh, the ritual the little rituals the micro rituals of the medical space it sort of moves away uh, even in terms of uh, psychological studies it moves away from the trauma model uh, and looks at illness and looks at uh, mental health looks at other kinds of conditions 
uh, as conditions would still go on for a while, right? And there seems to be some kind of a structure of domesticity around that, around the illness, which really problematizes the ontology of illness. It's not just about defamiliarization, it's not just about disruption. Uh, there's also a Cutodian quality, a daily quality. And I was fascinated when you said that, uh, you know, for example, when you stayed there, it just didn't stay for the day. The day became night and night became day. So there's no seamless continuum quality about the domestic uh, apparatus around the hospital. It's something that I think really lends a really original quotient uh, to your research. Would you care to comment on that or expand on that? The sort of the daily domestic quality of the hospital. Uh, is there something that you consciously think about? Is that part of your, is that a component in your investigation as well? Oh, oh, thank you so much for asking that question. Actually, I was hoping someone would ask me the dailiness because it's an obsession. I, right. um, I'm also obsessed with Veena Das's work. So right. um, the dailiness uh, quality, I uh, initially went that when I went there, I was also really um, fascinated by how the mess worked. Bec and also, I should also add the care, care workers in that space, uh, they use putative kin terms to address each other, unlike the main hospital complex where a male authority figure would be called sir or right. poo, a meso term poo, which is uh, used for uh, older authority figures. But within care home, people were calling each other uncle, auntie, you know, all the meso kinship terms for how, how, how a domestic space would operate. And that was also one of the things that I found very interesting. So even patients didn't call uh, the senior doctor, doctor this and that, they called him uh, pa. Pa is uh, a term used for maternal uncle. Um, yeah. That is also what I found. So if you want to begin to understand like the hospital as a domestic space, I think it would also, it's very nice to begin to think what kind of terms they use to address each other to, exactly. make, to make it more domestic. Um, this was one of the things that really fascinated me. Secondly was how the mess worked. It was like a home kitchen, even how people prepared food. Uh, the lady who was cooking actually, um, uh, uh, put in so much effort, even in just selecting vegetables that she would be cooking for the patient, uh, oh. what what would be good. And then she would also keep tab of what patients didn't like and, um, you know, dislikes and likes, which I, I found was remarkable. And this, these are the kinds of what Atriya would say, uh, affective labor, no one needs to know. It's like, it needs to even do, right? It's a place of work. You just go and do what you want to do. But here, I think there's this conscious effort to really care. And uh, and I don't want to romanticize it. Obviously, there are also uh, bad sides of all of this when it comes to, uh, uh, can you not use your gloves to touch certain things when you're preparing food? Or do you need to wear gloves to pre prepare certain foods for uh, uh, patients whose uh, immune system have completely collapsed? So those are also tensions. Uh, I'm aware of those tensions too. But this dailiness, uh, even uh, regarding spending time, so when I went during the day, uh, one of my challenges was also not being able to uh, uh, interact with many patients because they would sleep during the day. Because these are also patients, so one of the effects of pharmaceutical drugs is uh, sleeplessness, night horror, night terror. Um, and if you're not sleeping throughout the night, you're sleeping throughout the day. And this also posed certain challenges. Also, I couldn't uh, interview lots of patients because they were all always, uh, uh, they, they had like, uh, they were under medication. And right. ethical norms uh, don't allow you to interact with uh, patients when they're, so you, I would also, uh, so doctors or their family members would talk, uh, would speak on behalf of them. So that was one of the other things. Uh, I actually, uh, Professor, I found your, uh, when you mentioned strange, this strangeness, Quality. I think in my work, what comes out is this play of strangeness and familiarity. Right. And yeah, yeah, and in, in my work, I, I actually am very interested uh, in George Zimmel's understanding of the stranger. What does right. he say? It's the stranger who comes today to stay tomorrow. And this is right. precisely what patients are in, in, uh, in, in that space. Uh, yeah, these are some of the small, small examples. I mean, if anybody wants to know more, I'm more than happy. I mean, I could go on forever to explain yeah. them. No, it's fascinating because, you know, I think this is a very original and uh, sort of innovative lens because on the one hand, you're looking at, obviously, people are sick and require medical attention 
So there is that disruptive quality in the body, in the system, and that's the reason why they're there in the first place. But at the same time, as you very correctly pointed out, there's this whole structure of familiarity and kinship and touch and intimacy. So in a way, it's a very interesting interplay of intimacy and alienation, intimacy and estrangement, right? And as you, as you, you said examples, the kitchen operates like a domestic kitchen. The utensils are sort of non-medical in quality. Um, so they have the pestle and the mortar. And I can't get over that. That's such a fascinating example. Bringing in a pestle and the mortar to crush tablets. I mean, that's brilliant, really. But I was just thinking, because I'm uh, an old-fashioned uh, literary person. I teach literature. So there's an extreme example of... One second. There's an extreme example of this. Uh, it's sort of dark humorous as well, where we have a soldier squad. Uh, this setting is sort of Second World Warish, and we have PTSD veterans, uh, you know, come back from different parts uh, uh, during the Second World War, American soldiers. And the entire ontology of the medical space becomes not just normal, it becomes funny and humorous in a very, uh, what should I say, uh, in a very morbid way. So it's almost like gallows humor. So people are dying, but there's a domesticity to it. Uh, sort of, you know, breakfast is going on, people are reading newspapers, that goes on parallel to the accidents and the interventions and interruptions. And the novel is uh, Cash 22 by Joseph Heller. Uh, I do recommend it uh, if you haven't read it. It's, it's a very extreme, postmodern, dark, humorous example. But I think it's, it's trying to show something that you are working on at an ethnographic level the dailiness of horror, the dailiness of trauma. So, you know, these people are so numb, these people are so used to this, that they invent some rituals around which they can maintain and manufacture some kind of a tutorial uh, daily quality. But I, I think this this kind of research is really, really uh, original and uh, interesting. I think uh, Atria has a question. Uh, you can directly ask Atria if you would like to. I just don't have a question since uh, Genevieve mentioned about science and technology studies. I would just like to ask you uh, and the everyday too uh, regarding Michel Foucault's understanding of the birth of the clinic where he talks about the medical gaze and how doctors and uh, doctors and the body of the patient were separated and uh, scientists portrayed uh, uh, as sages in the modern era. So, uh, when I, even uh, talking about that example from Munna Bhai MBBS, which I recall today because that's really funny, but when I, doesn't, doesn't such ritualistic practices of separating yourself from the patient and treating him as an object of purification uh, kind of lead to a regular instrument? instrument? Uh, what was your finding regarding that or your experience regarding that? You could like to throw some light. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, no, I move away a little from the Foucauldian understanding of how these uh, interactions between patients and doctors produce certain forms of knowledges about the body, right? Um, that's one thing. But if you, if you, if you go back to my presentation, this is a place which has multiplicity so it's not operating just as a hospital ward which is producing certain sorts of knowledges but is also operating like a home it's operating like a, a outpatient clinic um, so um, so you have these multiplicity but in graceful because the primary care which they say they are giving is hospice care it's actually towards more of the charitable hospital kind of practice. So um, they're not consciously uh, thinking about how, you know, in the Foucauldian sense, okay, let me write out every symptom that this patient, obviously that's part of patient files, but that's just one part of the work. Most of the work is actually directed to what I call in my thesis beyond symptoms. So beyond symptoms, the objects of care are how do you get a patient uh, from one ward to the other? Does he have enough money um, to get that x-ray test? Uh, who, does he have a home? Once he's discharged, where will he go and stay? Um, so these are the sorts of things that uh, they were most, uh, uh, their primary focus was on. Um, because at the end of the day, HIV AIDS is uh, not about, so it also operates in a very different way from hospital clinics where you know there's a cure and you will get better. Here in the uh, in the in the HIV ward, uh, you have medicines to manage symptoms, and uh, the idea. And I'm still hopeful, so I will say there's no cure yet, um, and that's how work takes place in the in the ward. Um, so yeah, I move away a little from that. Uh, one of the things um, I, I also want to address uh, Professor's uh, question on soldiers. What's Catch Catch Twenty Two? I know it's a very interesting work. Uh, I 
uh, I am actually proposing a model of care here in ward where uh, a lot of the healing, so not cure, the healing of patients takes place through humor. And the everydayness comes yeah. from even, even minimizing mental health issues like uh, a patient being uh, uh, distant, not wanting to talk on a particular day, mood swings, mood change. You know how they domesticate it. They 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 domesticated by uh, teasing them and saying, "Stop sulking, stop sulking. You get better." You know that kind of thing also happens. So they domesticate, and this is not to undermine, but I think it's one way in which these two doctors are also advocating a very specific kind of care where you try to. Um, not make a big deal out of it, you know? You have to, like, once you get out of this ward, you'll have to deal with it on a daily basis anyway. So let's figure out how to do this. And it starts by, they start by laughing and joking, first of all, so that patients are comfortable to talk about their conditions. And this condition also comes with the wasting of the body. So how do you begin to socialize weight loss, hair loss, um, uh, skin rashes? And this is how patients and patients also begin to tease each other, you know, and even just uh, uh, fat shaming, not fat shaming, body shaming jokes become very common, very common. Right. Yeah. Right. So in an interesting way, I mean, dark humor, oh, which would otherwise perhaps sometimes be considered offensive in a certain sense, uh, is interestingly uh, useful in situations like this, because the, the darkness of the humor is exactly what makes it useful in a certain sense, like as in Cash 22, where soldiers are gambling in terms of who's going to die first, and they're putting money on it. Uh, and, you know, and you, you have a lot of death jokes. And that's probably some kind of a ritual, uh, which is sort of created and manufactured as some kind of a self-preservation strategy, right? Because they all know they're going to die at some point. And in a certain sense, that is comparable to an age clinic. Because all know they're going to die. Maybe there's no cure. Maybe there is, there is that quality about not knowing. Uh, but then, in a way, to pass time or to fill in time in a certain sense, they invent these jokes. And again, there's a Freudian quality to it. Right? The joke has a death drive, the joke has a life drive, and the interplay between death and life. True jokes for the production of funniness. Right? So I think that's really uh, fascinating. And I'd be very interested to see where you go with your research. Because if you add humor to this, because already you're complicating the sort of the site with the discourse of dailiness, discourse of the scriptorian quality. And then you add humor to it, and it's otherwise medical dark side. And that really problematizes the entire ontology of caregiving and also suffering. So I think that's absolutely brilliant. Uh, is there any other question? I can quickly ask one question to Reshma, uh, if I may. Uh, Reshma, are you around? Uh, can you hear me, Reshma? Yeah. Right, okay. So I think, uh, uh, pardon me if I'm wrong, but I think at some point in your presentation, you mentioned uh, Hitchcock's births. Um, yeah. yeah. And I think that's a really interesting example because a lot of works done on birds uh, from different perspectives. There is a lot of feminist study on birds in terms of the release of some kind of a repressed uh, alter ego. And more recently, there have been some studies done on birds which equates the sudden production of the uncanny with the refugee crisis, right? So suddenly uh, things that you don't see, uh, things which are already there. For example, in that film, if you remember, uh, I'm sure you do, the birds are always there. I mean, no one sees them until they become violent, uh, until they have a body, right? So this production of not just uncanny, but the production of the supernatural body, the supernatural corporeality. So, Birds are always already there, but no one noticed those birds, right? It's only when they begin to become uh, a body that they begin to become visible. So I was wondering uh, if you, apart from effect studies and obviously speciality, uh, do you look at any potentially political readings in horror cinema in terms of questions around race, marginality, uh, liminality, spectrality, the underprivileged? Uh, do any of those readings come up in your discourse, I'm just curious. Yes, sir. Sir, I have actually mentioned about that in my presentation, especially right. uh, related to racism. And I've, yeah. I, I've uh, talked about this to your previous question. I've answered this question. Uh, right. Like, about how the soil plays a huge role. Like uh, right. the white settlers become uh, the refuge of 
uh, non white fugitives and so the soil at us in the movie pet cemetery we could see how the dead victor who is a black who says that the land is sour right and, okay, uh, which is also a representation of how which is uh, he talks about the ancient burial ground in the movie pet cemetery so right. um, we could see how white and non white the uh, contrast between white and non white as you have rightly pointed um, right. and i've also mentioned about how landscapes in inhospit inhospitable to white settlers became the refuge of non white uh, right for some examples like how uh, the soil becomes or uh, it becomes the tool of rebellion like i've mentioned earlier uh, the poisonous plants to halt a forced pregnancy or perhaps to kill the master and rapist and herbs right. to heal wounds inflicted to work and punishment and zombies to run against humans so soil uh, becomes a central trope uh, from one perspective to another like from sheltering to another like that and you have also uh, mentioned about birds um but I've, in my presentation i've uh, just uh, look how space or spatiality plays a huge role uh, to portray horror uh, but there yeah. are more interesting uh, movies uh, and uh, uh, literature related to how um, animals plays a huge role uh, how uh, animals portray horror like um which which is actually a question of anthropocentrism which poses the question of anthropocentrism and right. the tension between homo, uh, human and non human have always played a role in the horror genre uh, the best example is of course the birds by alfred hitchcock and we could uh, also suggest some other examples like yeah. spielberg's uh, jaws and uh, we have some interesting examples of the day of the triffids where uh, carnivorous plants life is portrayed how they attack humans and we have an, another examples like the ruins the happening there are so, so many examples to uh, portray how uh, the human and non human the conflict between human and non human and nature act as a reminder of the threat non human nature is to the humans who too often forget that they do not rule the planet with it without the complete or with complete dominion exactly exactly so in a certain sense i think what horror movies really play on is the entanglement of fear and fantasy for the other there's this fear of the other there's also this fantasy of the other and the other sometimes is a construct of the fantasy which then is feared uh, to a certain right. extent and i think in the case of birds is really interesting because if you watch the beginning of the film uh, the birds are perfectly domestic creatures they're inside cages they have been sold in a shop uh, they are nice cute commodities uh, and you know the humans are just consuming them visually uh, or as pets or whatever and suddenly that chain of production consumption is interrupted right and then the birds become something else so it's quite literally a, a production of supernaturality right not true ghosts but true nature becoming something else and that's something you touched upon already in terms of defamiliarization of nature and as you pointed out i mean a lot of political reasons we could do i mean relating horror movies with contemporary issues around xenophobia uh, you know this anxiety of the refugee the fear around the refugee in terms of people coming over and taking over a land and of course uh, it's it's very territorial as well as you pointed out Uh, quite coherently that this territoriality becomes a very important plot in horror films see the land which belongs to someone suddenly becomes someone else so there's almost like a legal real estate concern which is there as some kind of an undercurrent uh, but but thank you so much both of you we could go on forever with this but i think these are really interesting papers i'm sorry we missed uh, lavanya's paper i'm sure i'm sure we could have learned a lot from that as well uh, but just in terms of concluding does anyone else have any other questions um we could ask directly um uh atri atri has a question in terms of how to locate the character of the joker as a contemporary figure and do you want to address this to uh, reshma or Atria, is it addressed to Reshma? Yes, sir. Yeah, Reshma, can you quickly comment on that? Uh, we're probably running out of time, but can you sort of have a quick response to the 
location of the Joker in Horror Films, you know, that kind of a clown figure who's also evil and perhaps ghostly as well. Thank you for the question, Apriya. So, uh, yeah, uh, like I've already mentioned, how uh, the marginalized ones are portrayed, or in uh, they are portrayed with the help of terror. Joker is also a movie. Uh, like Joker, we have an I think an umpteen number of films that portray how the marginalized one uh, start to speak against the uh, the superior ones, or precisely saying the uh, non-white speaking to the white and the marginalized speaking to the uh, superior one. So we have uh, a number of films like Joker. Uh, I think a movie named It It, which also uh, deals with how a Joker was marginalized, how he uh, started to retreat, and yeah, I think uh, it can be viewed with the help of how marginalized, how marginalization affects the people and all, how they talk back. Right. Um, does anyone have any other question? Um, um, all right. Uh, thank you, Professor Parvi, Reshma, and Genevieve for that interesting session. Uh, we also thank the audience for their questions.